it gives me a uh, great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, uh, Zoe Isprov, who will be talking on Constructing the Ghoul Boys, querying, uh, querying Ethics and Identity in BuzzFeed Unsolved and its Real Person Fiction, RPF. Uh, this particular talk is co-sponsored by Hamilton Library, the Spark M. Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, the Academy for Creative Media, the School of Communications, and the Departments of Political Science and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Uh, Zoe is a writer and academic uh, who is currently a student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, she finished her undergrad as a creative writer who was frustrated by the confines of genre, aren't we all? Um, and she continued on into graduate school to explore both queer theory and genre. She is currently working towards a master's degree in English with a concentration in literary studies, uh, and her interests lie in contemporary literature, popular digital literature, and queer theory. She's con currently completing a thesis on Ed uh, Edgar Cantero's Meddling Kids that considers how the book crafts queer identities and models a queer approach to genre. Um, she is going to be graduating this semester with a master's in English and literary studies, and she's going on to a PhD somewhere, and I happen to know that she already has offers, so it's not going to be a matter of whether, but it's going to be a matter of, of where, and supported in that work. She's published multiple creative pieces in Manoa Horizons, Vice Versa, Runestone Journal, and Litro Online. Um, she also, at the university, was the recipient of the Red Mandarin and the Lady Yixuan Chen Scholarship in 2019. And she also, at uh, the Southwest Popular American Culture Association Conference in 2020, uh, received the award for Best Graduate Student Paper, Charting the Third Way, Feminist Reimaginations of Patriarchal Religious Structures in the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Zoe is also the review's editor and editorial assistant at the Center for Biographical Research. In that capacity, what she has essentially been doing is um, managing all of the reviews that go into the journal, Biography and Interdisciplinary Quarterly, which is a very, very substantial responsibility. She also has been responsible for compiling the annual critical bibliography of uh, research on life writing. Uh, it's an annotated bibliography and usually has anywhere from 900 to 1200 entries. So uh, Zoe also has been the person responsible for advertising and essentially organizing and maintaining this brown bag series. So we thought nothing would be more appropriate in this her last semester uh, within our program that it would make sense for us to hear from Zoe because she's made it so possible for many of us to hear other people. Uh, we will very much uh, miss her and we've also learned from her uh, what kind of things we can expect and maybe what would be too great an expectation to expect from someone because Zoe is going to be a very, very hard act to follow. So it gives me great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Zoe Sprott. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, no, it, that's a, such a great introduction. Um, and I'm so honored to be here and honored that all of you came out to, to support. Um, Definitely, I want to thank Craig and Paige, who have been my bosses and mentors and friends and everything else <laughs> at the center since 2019, so a little while now. Um, I also have a few other thank yous. Um, I want to thank Jonna Eagle, whose mass media class I took in 2020, and uh, for that class, this was kind of an early version of this paper came out of that, and so really a lot of this is thanks to Jonna. Um, and with that, uh, I'll get into it a little bit more. Let me just go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Uh, when I tell people what I study, and as Craig told you all, I tend to have a really long list. Um, queer theory, contemporary literature, popular literature, digital literature. Uh, and I usually end that list by saying it's all the new and weird stuff. Um, this project is very clearly under that umbrella, and I want to acknowledge both the strangeness and importance of studying tricky and slippery media. Because this project necessarily requires a lot of moving parts, the first half will consist primarily of definitions. I'll talk about what real person fiction is and then what BuzzFeed Unsolved is. 
during the second half of the talk, we'll dive into the overlap between the two where all of that new and weird stuff happens. So without further ado, let's talk about constructing the ghoul boys. As I mentioned, the first place to start is with the likely unfamiliar genre of real person fiction or RPF. RPF is a subgenre of fan fiction, which takes characters, settings, or situations from an already existing source or canon and creates a story that is outside of that source. For example, there's a plethora of Harry Potter fan fiction that puts the characters of Harry Potter and Draco Malfoy into romantic and sexual situations, none of which JK Rowling herself wrote or sanctioned. RPF though, delves into trickier territory. Its canon material comes from real people, from their names, bodies, and histories. As such, it's considered ethically complex by both fans and scholars alike. Henry Jenkins, a leading fan fiction researcher, has said that some forms of slash, that is fan fiction centered around same sex romance or sex, were fandom's quote, dirty little secret. And I was asked not to write about real person slash. Tension between fandom and RPF have remained strong for decades, but the silence surrounding RPF is neither necessary nor productive. There have been several pioneering RPF scholars whose work I build upon today. Although I would be happy to go into more depth on their research, I'm going to have to prioritize clarity and concision. So here's the SparkNotes version. Jennifer McGee finds two ethical frameworks for RPF that are necessarily linked. In the first, the person or people at the heart of the RPF is, are viewed as characters, as personas of themselves and thus not real. In the second, the person or people are viewed as commodities, in the sense that uh, celebrity culture functions on the buying and selling of images and personalities. Melanie Piper goes in a similar direction. She suggests that biopics should be considered a genre that at the very least run parallel to RPF because it often twists and molds real histories into cinematic narratives. She pinpoints RPF's tenuous link to, to actuality as the origin of its ethical ambiguity and as the point where fans and scholars should debate whether RPF is an unethical denial of celebrity personhood or simply a logical extension of the fanish tradition of textually poaching popular culture. I'm sorry, I think my slides are kind of getting strange here. I'm gonna go ahead and stop and restart just because it seems to be going off. Let's try this again. Okay, that looks better. All right. Piper moves beyond simply pointing out the ethical dilemma of RPF uh, that RPF presents. She argues that the question of ethics and RPF can never be answered. So scholars should turn away from such questions and instead move toward looking at RPF as a textual process of adapting a real person into a character. She studies several biopics as texts in and of themselves, eschewing concerns of ethical ambiguity in favor of attending to how fans pick up or ignore certain factual details about the real people they represent. Another scholar, Judith Fathala, takes up Piper's gauntlet and pushes the field even further, suggesting that we study RPF as a digital text. This designation indicates that scholars should be paying attention not just to the RPF, but to everything surrounding it. Uh, tags, author's notes, and comments, to name a few digital elements. According to Fathala, RPF has flourished with fan fiction's move to the internet, a move that draws out RPF's inherent metalepsis. A brief pause for that SAT word. Fathala defines metalepsis as the self-conscious movement between actual and possible worlds, a process requiring participation and engagement on the reader's behalf. In other words, fan fiction and RPF require writers and readers to see not only the canon as it is, but also as it could be, to see possibility rather than finality. That dialogue between writer and reader is key to metalepsis, and as Fathala points out, very easy to find in the peripheral elements of digital text. By qualifying RPF as a digital text, Fathala moves to consider RPF as a form of postmodern fiction that is both explicitly concerned with facets of identity and playfully manipulative of them. I will be talking about RPF as a digital text, but here's where I diverge from these scholars. Ethics remains a key concern for RPF and RPF studies because fans are highly attuned to those ethical questions and frequently engage with them. 
Although a consensus on the ethics of RPF is unlikely to ever be attained, conversations surrounding <clears throat> such concerns remain an intriguing site for inspection without the goal of claiming all or part of the genre to be ethical or unethical. To quote from a few other RPF scholars, Eden Lackner, Barbara Lynn Lucas, and Robin Ann Reed, I seek to complicate the position by advancing the hypothesis that a spectrum exists between these two endpoints, with many shadings that have yet to be explored. Piper and Fathala both suggest that RPF is situated in a space of play in which fictionality plays with reality. I argue that that space of play is extended to ethical play. And because I'm an academic, I feel the need to make long and complex titles for everything. I'm gonna go a few steps further and argue that RPF is a transgressive queer genre, uh, or sorry, a transgressive queer text. <clears throat> Let's break that down, starting with queer theory. In general, there's quite a bit to be said about what queer theory is. And us queer theorists have been debating that question for decades. As its name suggests, queer theory does study LGBTQ plus identities and practices, but it has moved further. As an easy rule of thumb, we might use queer theory to discuss identities, positionalities, and concepts that do not easily fit into normative categories. Queerness not only resides, <clears throat> but thrives in complex disruptive spaces. Alexander Doty is more concise than I am. He defines queerness as messiness. Uh, <clears throat> and RPF certainly resides in a messy space in terms of ethics, as well as identities and realities. The tension between blurry categories of real person and fictional persona is dramatized in the representations of RPF as, uh, and the category of real is interrogated and destabilized through such dramatizations. Now, I'm writing an entire thesis, as Craig mentioned, on a queer approach to genre, so I could say a great deal more about what makes a text queer. But let's settle for now on Donald E. Hall's definition of a queer text. He argues that it's not enough for a text to contain queer characters to be considered queer. Instead, a queer text is defined by its relationship to normativity. Queer texts do not deny the normative, but instead they provoke it, call its bluff, nudge it towards self-interrogation and change. For Hall, queer texts necessarily trouble norms and by extension, create discomfort. So where some may argue that all slash fiction is, <clears throat> excuse me, and its depictions of same-sex romantic sexual relationships queer, Hall's definition of queer text suggests moving away from such simple categorization. In order to make such an argument, it is necessary to push back against the notion that there is a unified definition of queer and that fandom or fan fiction is either queer or not queer. Although slash fiction is certainly queer in the sexualities it depicts, it is not necessarily a queer genre. In particular, it does not always present a queer approach <clears throat> to power dynamics, as Hall suggests a queer text would. In this case, queerness is applied not just to individual sexual and romantic relationships, but to larger relationships with power and normativity. From here, the arguments for both queer and transgressive designations become intermingled. Tim Dean defines transgression as involving violating not so much rules or social conventions, but more precisely taboos. As we have already seen, RPF could easily be considered taboo in fan communities, as Henry Jenkins observed earlier, and as fans themselves, even those who write RPF, still suggest. For Dean, trans transgression concerns not the law, but the limit, because the threat of punishment comes from inside rather than outside the self. Transgressing laws that one regards as unjust, arbitrary, or externally imposed is easy enough. Here, we observe the difference between transgression and civil disobedience. What is much harder to sustain is any transgression of one's own internal limits. In the comments of RPF readers, there is a clear sense of crossing the self's boundaries, as one user, the Hemlock, states in regards to RPF. I was very hesitant about reading this. Breaking a taboo is not a small act, uh, and doing so is meaningful. In this case, its meaning lies in the ecstatic obliteration of the self's boundaries, in touching what is supposed to remain untouchable. That is, in touching, molding, and playing with another person's identity through RPF. There's something quite queer about this obliteration. In the introduction to his book, Queer Theories, Hall ruminates on why queerness engenders such strong feelings of discomfort, ultimately tying queerness to destabilizing notions of selfhood. He states that queer theories always recognize our own acculturation into notions of normality in ways that demand ongoing critical attention uh, 
to the actions and belief systems comprising ourselves. Combining these key attributes of queerness, queer text, and transgression, I argue that RPF is, in and of itself, a transgressive queer genre. One which troubles norms of identity and, drawing again from the latter of Hall's quotes, demands ongoing critical attention to what constitutes a self and, further, who can contribute to such contributions. Et voila, we have arrived at RPF as transgressive digital queer genre. Now, a brief note on methodology. Fan fiction necessarily requires an intertextual approach, one that takes into account the myriad of sources that a single piece of writing works off of. If RPF is a type of fan fiction, a genre in which fans take characters from canon universes and create fictional storylines or worlds around them, then its elements can be similarly drawn out. For fan fiction, for example, that, that fan fiction really is its own piece of fan fiction and the canon uh, that it works off of. The canon for RPF then becomes the real person or people around which the RPF is crafted. In RPF, identity, the outward public construction of self, becomes a text, one which requires just as much attention as the RPF itself. Continuing with the fan fiction classification system, RPF is then an interplay between two key elements. First, there is the source identity, the identity that the RPF subject constructs separate from how it is interpreted and understood by others. This identity, as with all identities, is not stable, but rather constantly under construction, forged and reforged with every action and word. The second element is the imagined potentiality of that identity. So in studying BuzzFeed Unsolved, I am considering the content of the RPF, the digital text surrounding the RPF, the BuzzFeed Unsolved series, and the BuzzFeed Unsolved host digital engagements. With that, then, we can move on to our source material. BuzzFeed Unsolved posted its first episode, The Mysterious Death of the Somerton Man, on YouTube on February 4, 2016, beginning its first season with true crime cases. The series was created by host Brian Bergara, who's on the right of this image, if it loads, uh, and co-host Shane Madej. Uh, Madej did not make his first appearance on the show until the July 2016 episode, The Secret Society of the Illuminati. Together, they have produced 12 seasons total, alternating between BuzzFeed Unsolved True Crime, in which they, unsolved, they examine unsolved crime cases, highlighting possible theories surrounding them, and BuzzFeed Unsolved Supernatural, in which they discuss supernatural occurrences across the globe, present theories surrounding them, and often visit haunted locations. In these episodes, Bergara is cast as the believer, and Walma Day is the skeptic, who does not believe in the supernatural. Although originally hosted on BuzzFeed's YouTube channel, Bergara and Mede created their own YouTube channel, BuzzFeed Unsolved Network, or BUN, in May 2018, illustrating that their fan base was strong enough to support a freestanding network. BUN currently has 5.2 million subscribers. Although their network hosts a variety of series, the core viewership still revolves around BuzzFeed Unsolved, the only series Mede and Bergara hosted on this channel. In 2019, Bergara and Madej quit BuzzFeed in order to create their own media outlet, Watcher, with fellow ex-BuzzFeed employee Stephen Lim of the series Worth It. But they have continued to create videos under the BuzzFeed brand, in part because of their contractual obligations, but also in order to maintain the brand that they have created while transitioning into a new one. In discussing the move, Madej says, luckily we have a very supportive fan base who keeps an eye on the stuff we do. Madea and Bergara's ventures and lives do tend to garner attention from their fans, which is the key factor that makes BuzzFeed Unsolved RPF a good candidate for RPF studies. Melanie Piper discusses the incredibly complicated practice of RPF for fans to navigate and maintain the fourth wall as celebrities perform public versions of their private selves on social media. And her observation is incredibly relevant in light of the emergence of social media influencers and YouTube stars like Bergara and Madea, who do not play fictional characters in their video appearances, but rather use their own names and appear to interact casually as themselves. As I mentioned before, identity on social media is complex and has been called performative, a word that makes clear both the flexibility and constructedness of identity. Madej himself points out that performativity when, in a Q&A video, he said, I'd just like to remind everyone that we are first and foremost actors. It can be tricky to talk about celebrity identity when there are a variety of people building and, and, and interpreting the identity of a single person at one time. For today, let's use these two working definitions. 
Persona is the identity performers embody in front of audiences and personality, on the other hand, is the identity they embody away from audiences. Of course, there will be overlap in gray areas, but for now, this language helps with clarity. So while the line between persona and personality is sometimes clearer for other celebrities, such as actors who play fictional roles for their personas, that line is very hazy for YouTube personalities who perform as themselves. In the first BuzzFeed Unsolved episode filmed during COVID-19 stay-at-home orders, Mede and Bergara film separately from their own homes, and Bergara tells Mede that he has brought the Bun community into his room, a private personal space that is now publicly broadcasted to millions. The boundary between persona and personality, then, is constantly muddled, which ultimately collapses the two into one another to form complicated public identities in which any notion of a stable core self is troubled. Of course, that is not to say that Bergara and Mede avoid taking on other identities throughout the show. Perhaps most famously, Bergara creates a fictional alternate persona, Ricky Goldsworth, which appears across the series in a number of jokes between Bergara and Mede. Most of the personalities, though, are based on real historical people, usually those encountered in the cases that Bergara and Mede review. C.C. Tinsley is one such example. He's a private investigator mentioned in the mysterious disappearance of the Sodder children and is taken up as a, as a persona by Mede across multiple episodes and seasons. Often such persona adoption takes place only over short moments of comedic banter or bits in a single episode. The regular engagement with fictionalizing accounts of real people is one of the clearest contributing factors to the popularity and structure of RPF about Bergara and Mede, who seem to foster such an environment of taking up real identities and channeling them into fictional stories. Let's return for a moment to McGee, who talked about the two interlocking ethical frameworks for RPF, person as character and person as commodity. I'd like to add a third to that list, person as instigator. In her work, McGee references another scholar, Martin Buber, and his comparison of communication as dialogue versus monologue, which concludes that the former is a more ethical way of approaching relationships because it aims to treat what one is communicating with as a person rather than an object. One important element of dialogic relationships, though, is that participants strive for authenticity, honest self-preservation uh, presentation without facades or false images a quality that Bergara and Mede cannot be said to embody in their series. By knowingly breaking this first ethical protocol, they set a precedent that their fans follow, taking up Shane and Ryan's personas as objects to be used for one's own ends in order to create new stories. Thus, Bergara and Mede become instigators, encouraging fans to participate in their own breach of authenticity ethics. What allows them to instigate though? In large part, we can attribute to this to the fact that BuzzFeed Unsolved is ultimately a comedic series. Let's take, for example, those personas that Bergara and Mede adopt based on real people. Their bits rely on schadenfreude or laughter produced by the misfortune of others. But here's the thing. Although their cases inevitably deal with the misfortune of others, those unfortunate people are rarely the center of jokes in the series. Instead, the figures around them, bumbling police officers, shady mobsters, suspicious neighbors, etc., tend to be the comedic centerpiece. This kind of humor serves to distance the identities of the real people they discuss from personality into the space of persona, ultimately forming them into characters, not people, just as with ethical, uh, McGee's ethical theory, they are comedic objects, not subjects. Further building on schadenfreude as a comedic device, we must remember that its purpose is to relieve tension in the audience. Laughter at the misfortune of others is also a sense of relief that such misfortune is not happening to oneself. Furthermore, schadenfreude usually requires context or a play frame in order to function properly. It is not socially acceptable to laugh when someone, for example, falls off a cliff in reality, but it is acceptable when it is clear that such misfortune, misfortune is fake. These two qualities, relief and play frame, are at the heart of BuzzFeed Unsolved's comedy. Firstly, the series takes place in a previously established play frame. BuzzFeed itself, as an organization, tends to publish more humor and comedy than anything else, and this was the context in which BuzzFeed Unsolved was first released and disseminated. Bergara and Mede's continual process of constructing comedic objects further strengthens that play frame. Secondly, the series provides audiences with interludes of humor between unsettling case details in order to relieve tension. Bergara himself illustrates the value of such relief when exploring allegedly haunted houses. 
When entering rooms alone, he's often visibly panicked and has on occasion even screamed. But he tends to calm down and he begins joking to himself or when he finds Medea again, who inevitably makes irreverent jokes about the ghosts or demons he does not believe in. Schadenfreude, even in this revised state, revolves around pressure, pleasure drawn from unpleasurable acts. And this pleasure is at the heart of BuzzFeed Unsolved's mission and popularity. All of this leads to an important question, one that examines the very purpose of the series. Why twist horror into comedy? It is tempting and in part accurate to suggest that Bergara and Madej simply adopt this approach in order to build their popularity, but there have been several series focusing on the same content that have grown quite a following without incorporating comedy. The majority of History Channel programming is evidence enough of this. Furthermore, Bergara and Madej are not the first to attempt mixing comedy and horror in such a series as this. One of its most similar predecessors is Mystery Hunters, a popular kids series that ran on Discovery Kids from 2002 to 2009 and examines supernatural cases with scientific rigor and skepticism. Because of its targeted audience, the show did not spend much time discussing actual deaths, but they did create an atmosphere of horror around their investigations while incorporating interludes of levity. Although both Mystery Hunters and BuzzFeed Unsolved use laughter to relieve tension, they do so in importantly distinct ways. Mystery hunters crafted jokes that are not as ethically complex because they made themselves, that is the three hosts, rather than the subjects of their investigations, the butt of the joke. The ethically ambiguous space in which BuzzFeed Unsolved resides is neither coincidental nor insignificant. Bergara and Madej inject comedy into horrifying tales and investigations in order to call attention to the norms of humor American society has constructed. As a deeper exploration of schadenfreude reveals, comedic norms do not often align with basic societal norms. Comedy has greater leeway to venture into ethical gray areas. According to Patricia Neville, comedy by its very nature interacts with and reinvents social and institutional meanings. As a result, it challenges our construction of reality and presents us with an alternative symbolic space or play frame as an acceptable site where taken for granted assumptions can be openly queried and debated. By introducing a comedic spin to true crime and the supernatural, two areas that American society is labeled scary, Bergara and Madea are questioning the assumption that such content must be locked up in a space of fear. Furthermore, and more significantly, by centering their jokes on real people, they challenge the notion that the identities of real people can only be constructed and taken up by the body in which that identity was first created. This would normally be a point of anxiety and has been historically and recently in the cultural policing of biopics such as Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocket Man, which faced criticism for discrepancies with the identities and histories of the real people they represented. But the comedic play frame that BuzzFeed Unsolved constructs alleviates such tension and allows for an examination of an ethics of participatory identity. Okay, so I just threw a big term out there and mostly uh, I'm doing that because it's cool to come up with new titles for old things. It sounds complicated in ethics of participatory identity, but really we can break it down quite easily. To start, let's talk about what has been woefully absent from our discussion of BuzzFeed Unsolved so far, fans. Fan participation is an important element of the BuzzFeed Unsolved series and its ongoing popularity. After several seasons, Bergara and Madea began producing weekly BuzzFeed Unsolved postmortem videos in which they would respond to fan comments and questions regarding their most recent episodes of BuzzFeed Unsolved. Through this feature, fans began picking up bits from the show to continue in comments, which Bergara and Madea uh, would then themselves respond to, thus creating a cycle of play between canon producers and fans. For example, uh, oh, sorry, on several occasions, Madea and Bergara have even planted pranks on fans during episodes. For example, in the episode, The Mysterious Disappearance of Roanoke Colony, a mannequin, which has long been part of an in-office set, slowly moves its head in the background of the video. The moment is not foregrounded, and Madea and Bergara do not comment on it in this video. In the postmortem for the episode, Bergara reads out a comment mentioning that the mannequin's head moves, but responds only with a laugh, while Madea says, it's a pretty windy studio. He often attributes possible supernatural occurrences to the wind. In bits like this, Bergara and Madea expand the space of play to include audience members and fans as well. It is no surprise then, that members of the fandom continue to work within and further construct the space of play as they create fan works, including a sizable collection of RPF. Returning to McGee, dialogue is at the heart of fan fiction, and BuzzFeed Unsolved fans have a direct line of dialogue to with the can producers. 
such an interplay between canon creators and fans is incredibly valuable, and fans can speak directly with Vergara Mede through the postmortem episodes, meaning that they can affect canon content as well as fanon or fan made tropes that are widely accepted in the fandom. There's a lot of BuzzFeed Unsolved RPF out there, so we're going to focus on the pieces with the most kudos, similar to likes or uh, likes on Facebook on, or Twitter, uh, in the Ryan Vergara slash Shane Mede tag the most popular tag in the BuzzFeed Unsolved fandom, which romantically and sexually pairs Vergara and the day. Uh, and all of this will be through Archive of Our Own, a popular fan fiction website. The first piece is Waiting Here for Catastrophe by Anarchetypal, in which Shane reveals to Ryan that he is a serial killer. The second is I'm Clean Out of Air in My Lungs by Striker Eureka, in which Ryan discovers that Shane is a demon. You'll notice I've switched from using their last names to their first. For clarity, I'll be using their first names when referring to their characters in fan fiction and their last names when referring to Bergara and Madei themselves. As the descriptions of these two pieces suggest, the majority of highly kudos Shane Ryan RPF is also tagged as being in an alternate universe or AU, often close to reality, but not quite the same. So for example, Shane is really a serial killer or a demon, two popular tropes. Although these tropes sound like they belong to horror fiction, Shane, Ryan, RPF tends to take a comedic turn, just as their canon material does. In actuality, this should not be surprising, considering that the majority of AUs in this archive are continuations of bits from the series, including the two above. Although Bergara and Madej never explicitly joke about Madej being a demon, he often acts aggressively in locations supposedly haunted by demons, challenging them and claiming their spaces as his own. It is Madei's identity that is often picked up and cast into a new form, demon or serial killer, and McGee can offer some insight into why he, rather than Bergara, tends to be the object of this play. She argues that fan fiction is founded upon the dream of making the character more real to the fan, and illustrates that such dream fulfillment usually occurs via breaking, through traumatic events, characters with tough facades, because such a facade makes authenticity and dialogue impossible. BuzzFeed Unsolved, Mede has, uh, sorry, <clears throat> Mede has not on camera gone beyond comedy and jokes to reveal any deeper emotions, whereas Bergara frequently does so. Thus, Mede has maintained a so-called tough facade, positioning him as a prime target for more extreme identity play. Although there are a handful of Shane Ryan fanfics that quote, break Shane and draw forth his emotions, the majority of them reject the trends McGee observes in favor of, learn of leaning even further into Madei's unemotional position by making him monstrous or inhuman, illustrating how play in this fandom often acknowledges fandom norms only to reject, comment on, or satirize them. <clears throat> Ultimately, the practice of extending bits from the series returns to the heart of the show, as both Bergara and RPF and Archetypal point out. In the November 2017 episode of BuzzFeed Unsolved Postmortem, Roanoke Q&A, <clears throat> Bergara states, I don't believe every theory I posit. I have to put out all the options in the video. I'm letting viewers make an informed decision. Earlier in 2017, in their RPF waiting here for catastrophe, Anarchetypal writes Shane telling Ryan the following after Ryan refuses to believe that Shane is a serial killer. You entertain all possible theories, right? That's what this stupid show is. That's what you do. So entertain this one. Both of these quotes showcase the aim of BuzzFeed Unsolved, as well as the RPFs that the series has inspired, to seriously examine and entertain all possible theories in order to judge their likelihood. In other words, realness is the key concern of BuzzFeed Unsolved and its RPF. Where BuzzFeed Unsolved scrutinizes the realness of true crime and supernatural theories, BuzzFeed Unsolved RPF focuses on the realness of Madei and Bergara in reality and Shane and Ryan in fictionality. Both Waiting Here for Catastrophe and I'm Clean Out of Air in My Lungs express consciousness to, of the degree to which Bergara and Madea are acting for the camera in the series, dramatizing the switch between persona and personality with the use of cameras. In Catastrophe, Shane is visibly angry as Ryan describes a series of murders as belonging to a neophyte serial killer. Unbeknownst to Ryan, the serial killer he is talking about is Shane. At first, Ryan thinks that Shane's behavior is part of a bit but it eventually becomes clear that Shane is being genuine. The narrator writes, sympathetic to Ryan's perspective, this isn't like Shane interrupting Ryan mid-sentence to add comedic relief or some off-the-cuff banter. This is real. This is going to have to be edited out, basically. And this moment is followed by Shane abruptly turning off the camera, signaling the end of persona behavior and the beginning of genuine conversation between the two. 
The notion that the reel must be edited out because it is a break from the flow of the series is particularly fascinating and illustrative of the fact that although Bergara and Madej do collapse the line between public and private, fans are still aware of the performativity of BuzzFeed Unsolved. However, the camera can also function as witness to the reel, even if that reel does not make it into the final cut of the series, imagined or otherwise. In Air in My Lungs, Ryan spends weeks questioning reality after he and Shane get into a car accident, and Shane is unscathed despite being flung through the windshield. The line between real and fake is unclear to Ryan, and he must go through his days reminding himself that this is all real, a habit that is difficult to maintain as Shane assures him that nothing is different or abnormal, and that Ryan's mind is playing tricks on him. This is a dynamic that is common in BuzzFeed Unsolved Supernatural. Bergara often spends each episode panicking inside a haunted house while Madej tells him that the ghosts and demons are not real. With interludes of Bergara, Madej reviewing footage of possible supernatural activity in which Bergara remains convinced that he has found solid evidence while Madej inevitably disagrees and explains what else could have, such, could have caused such activity. These moments of review are dramatized in Air in My Lungs. Sitting alone in his apartment, Ryan discovers that Shane is a demon because he finds footage of Shane talking to a ghost before he turns to the camera with fully black eyes. The narrator writes of Ryan, he wants to immediately throw this in Shane's face and ask him to deny the evidence. But the excitement eventually wears off when he realizes the gravity of the situation. The camera reveals Shane's real identity to Ryan and Ryan in turn must confront the first piece of unquestionable evidence he has found. The plots of both of these stories and their significant relationships to cameras, recording, and acting highlights the tension inherent in Bergara and Madej's style of hosting, which obfuscates the boundary between persona and personality. Commenters on these stories express diverse understandings of Bergara and Madej's identity formations in BuzzFeed Unsolved, though many of them discuss Bergara and Madej as though they were characters, clearly viewing their public interactions as stemming from personas. Some examples of this stance include user Pandarum's comment, character personality down to the T, uh, and Whisper Weeze's praise, I love the way you wrote them both because it felt really in character and real. The latter comment intriguingly does not differentiate between in character and real, manifesting an important observation. Although persona and personality are constructed and showcased in different ways, one is not necessarily more real than the other, and both come together to create a quote, real identity. The, colla the collapse of these two constructions is also present in the comments. In discussing the serial killer AU, Knox writes that it is somehow so on point with characterization while also making Shane a serial killer, which makes me worry about Shane's personality. And Yo-Yo String, in a similar vein, notes that Shane is such an obvious serial killer sometimes. He'd be so bad at keeping it all in and like make casual remarks about it all the time. Both of these comments to varying degrees consider Shane's characterization in these fictional pieces to be reflections of Madej's persona and personality. Madej's identity then is picked up and molded by RPF authors who in turn maintain certain aspects of his persona while augmenting others, thus engaging in participatory identity formation, just as Madej and Bergara do in the series. It is at this point that ethical concerns surrounding RPF and participatory identity formation are brought to the forefront of discussion, though instead of passing judgments, it is important instead to examine how the fandom confronts such dilemmas. Author Stryker Eureka expresses discomfort at the notion of their characterizations of real people being found by the real people themselves, writing in their author's note, please don't read this if this is about you or your friends. On the other hand, some commenters suggest that Madame Bergara could have written one of these pieces themselves or tell the author to share it with them in the bunk community at large, perhaps in the hope that Madame Bergara might expand a bit further. The most common sentiment expressed though was hesitation to engage. User Helicopter Darlings begins their comment with, I'm not a huge fan of RPF, but while well, Catherine Collections writes, I swore to myself I wouldn't read anything for them, but this, this just broke my rule. Rule breaking is, in fact, how BuzzFeed Unsolved RPF functions. It is prudent to recall that comedy challenges our construction of reality and presents us with an alternative symbolic space or play frame as an acceptable site where taking for granted assumptions can be openly queried and debated. BuzzFeed Unsolved RPF does not ignore ethics or position itself above ethical standards. Rather, it puts readers into an ethically uncomfortable space and pushes them to query or to adapt Hall's pun from queer theories, query, the flexibility of identity formation without ethical norms to restrain such investigation. Thus, like BuzzFeed Unsolved, these RPFs dramatize such tension only to dissolve it through comedy and laughter. 
catastrophe ends with Ryan finding a severed head in his living room, apparently provided as a trophy of a recent kill by Shane. Ryan is horrified, but Shane is nonchalant and confused by Ryan's reaction. Shane explains, last week you went on that date with what's his face, right? And the next day at work, you were talking about what an asshole he was. And I said, hey, you want me to kill him for you? And you laughed and said, yeah, go ahead. The entire situation is a gory yet comedic misunderstanding because Ryan thought they were speaking in a play frame while Shane did not. Thus killing someone because he failed to understand a joke. The scene teases concerns over the boundary between joke and genuine, implicitly arguing that only someone who sees the world in an abnormal way would fail to recognize the play frame surrounding jokes about horrible circumstances. This moment also teases those who are primarily concerned with forming an ethical judgment about RPF's practices, as RPF functions in a play frame of its own. Although commenters may demonstrate that the boundaries between persona, personality, and identity constructions from outside the self are collapsing, there is also an understanding that, for example, Shane is neither serial killer nor demon, though it is fun to joke about. This final claim that ridiculous or even stupid theories are fun to joke about is quite significant. In The Queer Out of Failure, Jack Halberstam tells readers to privilege the naive or nonsensical stupidity because they may in fact lead to a different set of knowledge practices. Through comedy and what anarchetypal calls general narrative stupidity uh, in their tags, the ethics of participatory identity formation is teased and queried in an effort to foster new considerations for where, if at all, ethical boundaries should be placed. In this sense, RPF creates a kind of ar a oppositional pedagogy, one in which learning takes place completely independent of teaching. In other words, RPF authors merely present readers with ethical, ethically complex situations, while readers on their own must muddle through their own sense of ethics, distanced though not divorced from societal norms via immersion in the play frame. The rise of widespread media, social media use has brought questions of everyday identity formation to the forefront of academic and public concern. Although, as with any controversial topic, a wide array of diverse opinions have been expressed, one of the most visible reactions to such questions is anxiety. Identity has been thrown in flux, into a queer space, and as Hall reflects of queerness, the only thing to be afraid of is the messiness and complexity that is life itself, though, granted, that can be a very scary thing indeed. However, BuzzFeed Unsolved and its RPF demonstrate that destabilizing notions of singular core identities is nothing to fear. Rather, identity play can be productive, comedic, and collaborative. Bergara and Mede engage in participatory identity formation, playing with identities that are not their own, as well as offering up their own identities for the same kind of play. They construct a play frame through which fears of destabilizing identities and blurred boundaries between persona and personality can be confronted with lower stakes while frequently diffusing tension. Queerness here manifests as troubling and querying the ethical boundaries of participatory identity formation without providing a solution. Arguably, no solution exists. This queerness is present in BuzzFeed Unsolved. Every episode of the series presents and investigates a myriad of possibilities only to inevitably finish with Bergara stating that the cases and questions they discuss will, quote, remain unsolved. Because of this queerness, BuzzFeed Unsolved RPF provides an apt means of reorienting the field of RPF studies as a transgressive digital queer text, RPF teases out and queries ethical questions without providing answers. Such an approach encourages ethical considerations to remain relevant while also leaving space for an analysis of RPF as digital text. Ultimately, the ethical orientation of RPF and participatory identity formation remains fundamentally and playfully unsolved. Thank you. And thank you very much, Zoe. Um, you were already provoking questions and comments as you were talking along. Um, this is coming from uh, Katie R. There's uh, two questions here, although uh, Katie seems to feel you sort of answered one of them as you went along. Um, wouldn't the transgressive queer nature be further complicated by the manipulation of self through presentation through the digital platform? The ghoul boys have constructed a self that is both themselves and characters with a very, very blurry line between the two. When RPF is written, is it about Ryan and Shane or is it about Ryan Bugara and skeptic Shane? And then following, it's also, 
Katie follows up with the no talk rule of this form of RPF is somewhat an extension, an elevated form of fan fiction from its sources. Don't share your fic with the creators, isn't it? Response? Sure. Um, I think definitely the, the first question was kind of embedded in there with that kind of blurriness between persona and personality and the fact that although they're sort of separate, they're sort of not separate too in the sense that they're by the same person. And is there really one core identity? Not so. Um, in terms of the second uh, question, that kind of no talk rule, definitely that is an extension of fan fiction practices um, and one that dates back especially to uh, when there were greater concerns of copyright issues. Um, don't let this get to them because maybe I would be in legal trouble. Um, that's definitely part of that kind of source. Um, I think RPF, it has a more dramatic turn because it's different when it's maybe don't give this to the creator for either legal reasons or because um, it might be embarrassing to see their characters in different ways or that kind of thing. It's different when it's, I've written this about an actual person um, and this is them that I'm talking about. That can be, I think, a little bit more unsettling if, if there's not really a preparation for that. Okay, uh, Derek is having to take off, but he indicated, yes, Zoe, wonderful talk, thanks so much. I love the messiness that you identify, the blurring between horror and comedy and persona and personality. I have to scoot off like Cindy because of a 1 p.m. meeting, but great work. Thank you. Uh, other <laughs> questions or comments from people? Okay, I have, I have a couple. Um, uh, this is resonating in part, and, and this is where the question's coming from, but I can't, the nature of the talk means that it's making me put things together I ordinarily wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, I'm teaching Orlando this evening, okay? And uh, the fact that that narrative is about Vita Sackville West and she actually dresses up and poses in the portraits for Orlando, um, but there's also that film that Seth Rogen guys got involved with, with, with the end, where basically they got together as a group and got to write uh, basically fan fiction about each other or heavy duty RTF by, for example, uh, taking, what is it, Michael Sarah, and making him basically the spawn of Satan and, uh, and concentrate and, you know, and literally consigning each other to hell uh, in the actual narrative and, and um, fooling with Emma Watt. I mean, just everything they were doing there. So I was just wondering if you comment a little bit more about that dynamic of that sort of encouragement and to what degree queer theory in some ways engages with this notion of willing cooperation between individuals in encouraging either other people, whether friends or fans, in constructing narratives that then they actually enact? Yeah, no, I, I mean, Seth Rogen and James Franco are a fantastic example. And one, I, I think I had a reference in an earlier version of this to them and, and that kind of interplay that they that they have and that they encourage others to kind of be a part of as well. Um, I think one interesting point is where that boundary line really is. Um, because there is, you know, such a thing as the in group and the out group, uh, that even as you're expanding that group of who can play with these identities, there's a complicated point of where does that stop? Uh, does it stop in a certain, you know, outside of uh, that kind of categorization, a certain categorization of people, um, maybe those you don't know or those you do know, uh, does it stop with, um, apologies, uh, <laughs> does it stop with uh, the kind of content you're writing about, that, that sort of complexity is definitely there. I think in terms of queer theory, this is one area that, that I've been exploring that I haven't found a lot of particular scholarship on. Um, and not just in RPF, but I, I had at one point written about uh, Margaret Cavendish um, and her kind of auto fiction, as well as uh, Daniel Dutton's Margaret the First, which is essentially Margaret Cavendish biofiction or RPF, if you will. Um, and I think it's, it's an interesting boundary line because all at once there is this 
definitely a kind of queerness to that destabilizing the self, but at the same time, um, there is this kind of wrapped upness, uh, I think, at the core of especially the LGBTQ plus part of queer studies that is interested in that kind of practice of labeling and keeping some kind of point of identity that, that's legible, I guess. Um, and so I guess the answer is, I'm not sure, <laughs> uh, which is maybe a, a cheat answer in that, uh, you know, I get to leave it in that kind of unsolved space. But at the same time, I, I think it's a point where there, there could be more research for sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and Katie followed up and said, Ryan and Shane are a good example because of their activity online. Other RPF, like many Banfic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that are much more questionable ethically because they don't have as much that personal personality play, that kind of uh, separation. And we have another few comments following up on that. Uh, this is uh, John Zern. This question doesn't actually reflect my own reaction, but I'm wondering if some people might be concerned about the blurring of personal personality and fact fiction in a post-fact era in which we might have more to be afraid of than just the queer disruption of identity especially on social media. Response? Definitely. Um, that kind of paper I mentioned on Margaret Cavendish and Daniel Dutton and autobiofiction, uh, I had forwarded uh, a kind of idea that I walked back not long after of an idea of queer truth, um, which is immediately complex and complicated, especially with the idea of fake news and the idea that that could get wrapped up in, in itself. Um, and so I think there is that kind of fear and anxiety. And I, I think to a point there is uh, grounding to that kind of anxiety. But at the same time, it also implies that that wasn't there before, I guess. Um, there's always been this kind of boundary line, strange blurring of boundary lines, uh, even in just the idea of code switching, you know, you talk to one person differently than you would talk to another. I'm talking to you all very differently than I would talk to my partner or my parents or someone else. Um, and so there's always this kind of, you're always seeing fractions of an identity. And the way that those come together um, is that kind of queerness, I guess. Uh, there's something strange about seeing multiple sides of a person at once that maybe you're not used to. Okay. And Amy Carlson, um, speaking of blurriness, um, how far out does the play frame or text to consider go? I feel like fans bring some of this to other platforms. Uh, do you feel that you can easily define where the text stops? Shucks, I think you're talking about I can ask my question. <laughs> Uh, I did kind of mention that in, in talking to Craig, that kind of boundary line is is unclear um, and, and it's difficult to to put a point on it uh, because it is being taken up outside of the show itself and moved into different kind of categories of, you know, RPF, of fan, fan fiction in general, of fan art. Um, and that kind of blurriness is, I think, all at once, the that kind of ethical dilemma that that I refer to that doesn't really have an answer. That there there isn't, I don't think, a, any kind of set boundary out there. Um, and doing so might even complicate the idea of other people picking it up because it might instill this sense of oh maybe I shouldn't then if there is a boundary. The fact that there isn't really this kind of defined boundary, I think, allows for more of that freedom of play. Um, and again, this, the, the kind of, a lot of what I'm trying to get at too is not necessarily the like ethical judgment of it, at least for, for myself. Uh, and I think it is definitely, I agree with the many of the scholars in that it is an ethically complex area, but that kind of ethical complexity is, is kind of the, I guess the springboard on which to build and to see how fans take it up. Okay, this actually came up uh, during the seminar that created that book, The Ethics of Life Writing. Um, and the question, I'm just interested in terms of delineation here. Um, does RPF necessarily involve someone who is still alive? Or Not necessarily. Okay, no. that's the case, then I'm going Joseph Campbell. Um, changing or extending or transforming or querying 
dead historical figures has been a fundamental aspect of all fiction from the very beginning. It is the historical novel and so on and so forth. So if there's not a distinction without a difference, what specifically is the focus in on RPF? What does that delineate other than the fact that nobody can actually prevent anyone else from doing whatever they want with other people's uh, natures, identities, historical facts, and so on and so forth. Uh, this came up um, because there was an essay um, about a novel uh, that uh, was about Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes. The thing was that the woman who wrote the novel had been a lover of Ted Hughes's. So when she wrote about it, the notion of what was fiction and what was not, given her privileged understanding of the material, meant that the whole text was metastable and profoundly disturbing to people because it involved, other, among other things, uh, raising the suggestion with no evidence whatsoever that uh, Ted Hughes had essentially raped their babysitter. And, so, and the, the woman who was writing about this uh, just responded and said, in terms of these things, the dead have no rights. Do the living have rights? Right. And I think that's, I think in a lot of ways, that's the, I think that idea of there's not as much regulation of RPF and it, really there's not regulation in the sense that you can post it. Um, I'm sure some sites would take it down, but I know archive of our own, for example, has been very laissez-faire. Um, and so that is, I think, definitely part of the point of anxiety that there isn't, there's not really a lot of checks and balances. But at the same time, as you pointed out, that has occurred, that does occur. I think that uh, truthfully, I haven't really seen a lot of, uh, I haven't really seen in general, actually, um, real people that, you know, the RPF is about having any kind of interaction with it, at least not as far as I know, uh, you know, in the fan fiction term of it. Um, there is a, a fascinating and strange uh, book, and I'm forgetting what it's called, but it's essentially Barack Obama, Joe Biden fan fiction published and widely spread um, that I'm sure they had to have come across. But at the same time, it is a heroicizing and almost romanticizing. And so I think kind of as I was mentioning with the, the Seth Rogen, James Franco question, once you get into that hazy territory of what if you're not showing them in the most positive light and, you know, beyond, of course, Shane, serial killer, Shane Demon, um, at the same time, he's recuperated in all of these. He's a nice demon. He's a nice serial killer. Uh, and so I, I'm really, I think in a lot of ways, again, the answer is sort of, that's a good question. And it's, it's fascinating to think about. I think definitely the living do have rights, but at the same time, there is that same idea of the play frame, right? The same way that SNL can make strange jokes about real people. And those real people will definitely have responses, often negative, but at the same time, it's clear that it's not actually them doing it. Well, that would be the question I would go to. What, what are, rhetorically, what are the markers, if any, are there specific markers or are there, are there sort of conventions in terms of announcing that something is RPF? Or do you even um, need to, because there's the notion that yeah. you can actually confirm this isn't actually what the person's doing. Right. I think, uh, at least in terms of archive of our own as a, as a website, it, easily enough, you can tag it as RPF, um, but some people don't necessarily. I think there is just this assumption that if it's posted on a fan fiction website or on a fan fiction Tumblr or that kind of thing, that it's probably a fiction. It's, there's not someone making a testimony and saying, I've seen this, I know this. Um, and I think that's where I would say that's part of a cutoff line for RPF. Um, but at the same time, what does happen if it's posted elsewhere or adapted into something else? Well, that's where yeah. legally, I mean, right. if the markers aren't there legally, yeah. that's when it can become liable and actionable. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Other questions or responses from people?
Okay then. Well, I think the timing's worked out very well. Uh, we've been, you know, thank you very much for this and thank you for everything you've done for the center. 